This is lesson number 28 for tonight. And before we get started, let's uh, have our uh, brief word of prayer. Our Father, we thank you again for this fellowship of Christians that come together every Thursday night, those that are listening by tape. And Lord, we pray that the lesson tonight would be in accordance to your will, that uh, it can be applied to the hearts of the hearers, and that you're pleased with it. We pray for those in our church that has need this hour, that's uh, that has medical needs. We we pray for uh, for Olga, particularly, and others that have other kinds of needs. We just leave these uh, at your feet and ask you to uh, take them and have your will in their lives. We pray for them, though. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Now we're in Matthew. Chapter 25. Um, Pardon? This is number 28. Number 28. Yeah, there is just, uh, there's a lot fewer chapters in the book, but uh, we have a lot more tapes than what the chapters are because we just can't get through a chapter each time takes several tapes to do that. We're still, as a matter of fact, in the chapter that we were in, in our book, the Matthew Mysteries. Again, I want to uh, emphasize anybody that's listening to this, if uh, you want a book, you can certainly contact us and we will get a book to you. Uh, the books go for ten ninety-five a piece plus $2 handling, postage and handling be glad to mail you a copy, but you really need uh, maybe this a whole thing in print as well. All right, we want to come back where we left off last week, Matthew chapter 25, and we had come down to verse 14, beginning in verse 14, which is the parable of the talents. I've been trying to get this parable taught here for the last several a couple of weeks, and felt the need to stop and go back and add other things before we got to it. But I'll read it again, or partially again, and then try to give the interpretation as we go along. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered them his goods. As we stated last week, this man is Jesus Christ. Traveling into a far country is when he went back to heaven. And before he went, he called his own servants. But that own servants, his, that expression, his own servants, means all of those that are within the church, period, uh, that are to be in the bride, or that are called to be into the bride. And... Uh, Understand again that those who are to be in the bride are called out of those who are in the body of Christ. Now we're talking about a higher order of reward here because this man in the parable, Jesus, uh, he calls his own servants showing that they are saved and out of the body of Christ and delivered unto them his goods. And the his goods here in the Greek is the Greek word for his personal goods or his personal property. We've come to believe that that speaks of the thing that gives him the most joy, the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, this personal wisdom of the coming kingdom and him ruling over the kingdom. And uh, this goods then, the goods then are... Uh, 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 mainly uh, wisdom concerning this and uh, we, we call this the kingdom truths 
And then in verse 15, And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Now, I want you to notice there's only three men that he gives this to. As opposed to the parable of the pounds, which there were ten, he's not using the figure ten here in this parable, which stands for all of the church, because he's not going to be giving these talents to everyone in the church. He's only going to be giving uh, these talents to a particular few out of the church, and there's three here showing that this doesn't represent all of the church but a portion of the church. And he gives these talents, which are his personal goods, which are the kingdom truths, which uh, speaks of wisdom, and those who have it are wise, to these three servants, which belong to him, according to their several ability. One person has ability to do three or four or five things, and he gives them according to that. Others have abilities that can only do two things, and he gives talents according to that. And uh, the uh, number, uh, the, the third one here represents those of this group who have only one, ta uh, one uh, ability, and he gave a talent accordingly. Now, before we go on again, keep in mind that the talent here is about worth about 300 times more than the pound in the parable of the pound in Luke chapter 19. Though these parables sound similar, they are totally different. There were 10 people in Luke, Luke's parable of the pounds. There's three here. Uh, the pound is worth uh, a lot less than the talent, the talent about 300 times more. Then in verse 15, uh, as we see there, he gave five talents. Uh, he gave uh, five talents to another two and to another one. Every man according to his several ability. It is true that each and every one of us has different abilities. And I want you to notice that in this parable, unlike the parable of the pounds in Luke, all you had to do was to use whatever ability you had as a partnership with the talent that he gave you. And if you had five, you had to use five. If you had three, then use three. If you have one, you use one. But the, but the reward is the same. The reward is the same. Whereas in the parable of the pounds, everyone had one pound instead of five, three, or two. They all had one pound. And when one man produced ten pounds, he got, ten, he got twice as much as the man that produced only five, pound, uh, five extra pounds with his and the other one with uh, uh, one. So uh, they got a graduated uh, amount of rewards there, whereas here the reward is the same because they actually used what they had in their abilities. And uh, that's all they could do. Now, as I met, made mention of this last week, we heard a man while we were on vacation preach on this parable. And apparently he didn't see anything. He didn't has never understood the kingdom, never seen the kingdom, even though he admitted that uh, we were intended, sir, admitted, admit, admitted to the rest of the people that uh, I was there and I was uh, a, a, a pastor and that I had written a book and uh, so forth and so forth. And he had had a copy, but apparently either didn't read it or didn't agree with it or didn't see it or whatever. But uh, this parable to him, and he preached on it, only meant just everybody do the best you can. That's all it means. 
And when it came down to this one here that didn't do anything with his but went and dug a hole and put it in the ground and covered it up, uh, he said the reason the man did that is because he's jealous he didn't have five. He was jealous because he didn't have the three or the five. And that was his sermon, that don't get jealous because somebody else can got more, more uh, abilities and talents than you have. Not realizing that uh, the man that only has one is not going to lose anything if he just exercises as that one talent because the reward here is the same for all three. All right, well, let's go on. Uh, down in verse 16, Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. I want you to notice he did not go out and farm. He did not go out and gather where there was no straw. He went and traded. He went into the marketplace. Verse 17, and likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. Now, he's not saying that these people went out and led so many people to the Lord. No. That's in the parable of the pounds. Every Christian is to be available to tell someone about Jesus. No, this is the talents. Talents mean, mean are, are much more... Uh, 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 they're worth much more, 300 times as a matter of fact, more than a pound, and it speaks of the kingdom truths. Speaks, according to the things that we've been talking about in weeks prior, it speaks of the double portion of the spirit. It speaks of the double portion of the oil, which was in the ten virgins. Double portion of the oil speaks of the double portion of the spirit. It speaks of the wisdom and truth concerning the coming kingdom of the Lord speaks of rewards versus uh, the negative uh, 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 consequences at the judgment seat of Christ. There are going to be rewards. There's going to be negative consequences that will last for at least a thousand years. All this is wisdom all put together in the talent. And when you can give a Christian this and their heart is ready for it, it changes their life. It'll change your life. Maybe this is a time for me to mention that we got a letter this week someplace in Germany. This person had received a book, uh, my, my book on shock and surprise, Beyond the Rapture. It was given to her by Helen Gerlag of South Africa. And she was taking a um, vacation in Germany. And, uh, you know, it's hard for us to think people in other countries go to other countries for vacations, but uh, she did. And while there in the hotel, she wrote a letter. She said she took two books with her, her Bible and shock. And she had a glowing, of course, uh, praise of the Lord for the truths that were in it and how it changed her life. And, you know, that makes my day every once in a while. You get along, you go along in this old world and you just... Uh, Nothing seems to be right for a whole day, and all of a sudden you get something like that, and it lifts you up. And I'll try to bring the, remember to bring that to church Sunday and put it up on the bulletin board for you. I'm sure Helen Gerlag will be here in this date, so we give our thanks to Helen, too. All right. We, uh, we then understand this, the thing that says the talent. And here they go to the uh, place of, to trade that. That would be in the market. Uh, now, when Jesus comes back, he's going, to, uh, he's going to judge us at the judgment seat of Christ, and that's in this parable. Now, in verse 18, though, before we get to that judgment, this third one, he went and received one talent. He that received one talent went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. 
Now, all three of these are going to be judged by the Lord, which we will see is the judgment seat of Christ. It's within the parable. Here, the third one put his money in the ground, dug a hole and put his money in the ground. We talked to another person on our vacation here recently who uh, had been in our ministry for many years in Sunday school or in vacation Bible school, I don't know which, said she was trying to teach his parable. And when she came to this verse, one little the children stuck their hand up and says, I know what that third one is. I know why he did it. I know why he put it in the ground. And, and she wouldn't let her go on until she said, okay, you know, you tell us why he put that third one in the ground, third one, put that one talent in the ground. And the little kid says, he, won, he was planting a money tree. Well, <laughs> I understand, though, from, from a typical look at this, when I say typical, I'm talking about typo typology. The earth is always viewed in the scripture as the place where the thorns come from. It is of the flesh. Thorns come up out of the earth. When you bury something in the earth, in the ground, that's what that's talking about. It's a place where the thorns come so here a person dug and, and dug it and hid his Lord's money. Now, here comes the judgment seat in verse 19 and 20. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now I want to pause there. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. He, he names these particular servants as good and faithful. That's their name. Good and faithful. You won't find the word faithful over there in the parable of the pound which speaks only of the first portion of the Spirit, those leading people to Christ, as opposed to here, people leading people to see truths and thus, uh, the kingdom truths, and thus in, in, a, in a, soul, a true soul-winning uh, experience. So, uh, he, over there in, the uh, parable of the pounds, he just says, Well done, thou good servant. But he doesn't put the word faithful in it, because that's not the name of those in the parable of the pounds. They will be those of the wedding guests. But the parable, all, the parable of the, in the parables, there's two here that I want to bring to you, which show two different levels of the bride always gives the name of the bride as faithful. Sometimes it's the second part of the title. Sometimes it's the first part of the title. But anytime you see faithful, you understand that that's the bride. Now, we've been here before, but we'll go back briefly again to Revelation chapter 17. I want to show you the name of the bride here, the full name. When Jesus comes back, he, these will be with him. In verse 14 of the 17th chapter of Revelation, these shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them. He's talking about those here upon the earth now at his second coming. For the Lord is the Lord of lords, and the King and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen, and faithful. Now, these are the same people with three names. They're called, meaning they were saved. And chosen, they're saved out of the saved. You got Kaleo and that Kaleo. And uh, you remember that he used over in the parable of the wedding feast, only called and chosen. For he said at the end of that one, for many are called, but many are called, but few are chosen. But here you got called, chosen. Now you got one more level, he goes, and faithful. Therefore, he is speaking of the highest order of the church or the bride. 
Going back to our parable, he says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. That's verse 21 that I'm reading. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. What's the joy of the Lord? The joy of the Lord is the kingdom. Enter into the kingdom. Again, uh, Hebrews speaks of Jesus hanging on the cross. He allowed himself to die because that was his job. That's what his father had sent him to do for our sin, is to die. And the scriptures there say that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Now here we have that joy again. But here the joy both means the same thing, the kingdom. Our Lord looked at the kingdom, the coming kingdom, the bride, everything that would be his. And he endured the cross. Here, he says, enter into the joy of the Lord. Verse 24. Going back to Matthew 25 now. Verse 24. When he which had received the one talent. Excuse me, I didn't finish verse 23, did I? Uh, verse 22, that is, in 23. He also that had received two talents said, Lord... Thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. Notice he got the same reward as the man that had five. It wasn't his fault that he didn't have any more abilities. He just used what he had. He used what he had. You know, I really don't know how to explain this. I do know that we're all different. Some of us, God has called to preach, and so we have that ability because he's called us. And then he gave us a talent, and we must preach it. Others are teachers, can teach. Sunday school or whatever other kind of teaching that you may teach. Of course, every preacher should be a teacher too. Others of you may be musicians. Others of you may have a host of uh, myriads of different kinds of abilities. But you are to take that ability that you have and let it be in partnership with the talent that God gives you because what you're in, you're in a, you're in a partnership of winning souls, truly winning souls, scripturally winning souls. Now, of course, you've got to find yourself Someone's got to save spirit first before you can win their soul in this parable. I actually knew a preacher that understood all of the kingdom truths and had some of the greatest uh, first edition books on it that pastored a church and was so well versed in it that uh, some even had him write a forward in a kingdom book, yet he himself refused to ever preach it in his church. And this gentleman has already gone home to be with the Lord. Now, it's going to be up between him and the Lord, judgment seat. Now, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that he's the one that hid his in the ground. I don't know. But it's a mystery to me because knowing my own life and knowing why the Lord called me, I don't dare preach without preaching it. <laughs> and you, whatever your ability is, you don't, shouldn't dare uh, do your ability without weaving this in somehow. In not, I'm talking about into your life so that God can use it. You don't use it. God uses it through you. All you're doing is allowing him to live his life through you. And if this is part of your life, the literal spiritual fabric of your life, then whatever you do, it'll come out. Okay. Well, here we have, uh, here we have this parable uh, in which uh, we have the five and we have the two. Verse 24 now. 
Then he which had received the one talent came, said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not strawed. See, he went to the wrong place. He didn't go to the trading place where he's supposed to trade. He went out to the farm, and that's not where he was supposed to go. Now let's go on. Uh, and I was afraid and went and hid my talent, that verse 25, in the earth. I just, you know, I didn't use it at all. I just put it in the ground. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. And as Lord never, the Lord never gives those things out to people unless he's going to get some kind of return. That's like a man putting his money in the bank and never earning a penny on it. But, uh, of course, the man didn't even put it in the bank. He went out and uh, started uh, trying to farm with it. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slowful servant. Now, these words have thrown a lot of people. They want, they, they, they want very, very dearly to try to make this man a lost man because the Lord called him wicked and slowful. But the word wicked in the Greek means hurtful, and it's used many times for Christians. So we can be very hurtful to the Lord. Thou hurtful and lazy servant. Slowful is lazy. See? Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not strawed. Now, how did he know that? <laughs> the Lord says you knew it. How did he know it? Well, he was saved to begin with or he wouldn't have received these ta the talents. And he knew that if he went out and tried in the efforts of the flesh to produce something and the Lord wasn't in it, nothing would come from it. That's what the Lord's saying. Therefore, verse 37, verse 27, Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers. Now that means to the bank. It's what we would call the bank. And then at my coming, I should have my, I should have received mine own with usury. Back in those days, they used to exchange money and make a percentage for exchanging it. You do this in the marketplace, not out on the farm. Now, the reason he uses the emblem here of the bank is so that we can understand how God works in our life. When we give him our life, uh, now here you've got to understand there is a partnership. The life is made up of a committed life to the Lord along with your abilities and the talent, all of them together now, because that's what he gave you the talent for. They all fit perfectly together. When you give this to the Lord, and you yourself don't try by the efforts of the flesh to cause anything to happen, that's the same as putting your money in the bank. In other words, if you put your money in the bank and sat down and did nothing, it would make usury. The Lord here is saying, if you, uh, in this world, with all that I've given you, along with your abilities, you just trust in the Lord as you move from day to day and allow the Lord to do all the work through you, then that's the same as sitting down and letting the bank earn the interest. Because uh, the outside man now may be doing something, but the inside man is sitting down and resting in Christ. And that produces. We also understand that from other parables, you have to buy of Christ. We've discussed this. Buy of me gold tried in fire, he said. Buy of me. Go, go to the, uh, as the parable of the ten virgins, the five wise said to the five foolish, um, we're not going to give you any of our extra oil unless there not be enough for us. You go and buy from those who sell. Again, the marketplace. 
So in uh, in this uh, life, with what the Lord has given us, in order to gain more, there takes something. It it, it takes really something from our life. We have to commit our life in this commitment of our life portions of our life it's the same as buying because we're actually using our life to buy to trade now each time when we do this and I'm sure you're you would agree with me you think that you have given up ever lasting everything that you've got to the Lord everything that you've got you're totally committed over that's the way he wants it to be the only reason you think that is because you can't see any more in your life that needs to be given up. But then all that does and that commitment of yielding, all it does is move you closer to the Lord. It's like in a light source. If there is a great light source and you were standing way out, 100 yards from it, and you looked at yourself, you could not see the soiled hands or the soiled feet or the soiled hands. If you even looked in the mirror, you couldn't tell much. But the closer you moved to it, the more you could see until finally you were in the full light and you could see. That seems to be the trek of the Christian in this life. The closer we move to the Lord, the worse we see ourselves. And so... Uh, we move close, though, every day as we yield. We don't even move unless we yield. So as we yield, we move closer. We see how worse off we were than before. And then we yield again, and we get closer to the Lord, and we see how bad we are, and so forth and so forth, each time being worse than the last. And, you know, it's kind of... Uh, 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 it just uh, seems like it ought to work the other way. The closer to the Lord you get, the better you see yourself. But it doesn't work that way in the spiritual world. Paul said it best. He started off his life saying, saying, I'm a sinner. Then as he grew closer to the Lord, he said, I'm the chief of all sinners. Then as he moved closer to the Lord, he says, I'm an apostle. And then as he moved closer to the Lord, he says, I'm the I am the least of the apostles. <laughs> you know somebody that keeps getting better and better all the time and they don't ever see any, any sin in their life and they're moving further away from the Lord. Only those who come closer and closer to him see themselves in the light of the Lord. It causes us then to yield those things over that are sinful in our life so that we can be closer and in that same manner, that's how you employ the talent that he's given to you. It's a partnership with your life. And daily as you commit, the same as buy and sell, as you commit your part of your life to him and he gives you more of the talent, you're moving closer and closer uh, to him. And at the same time, as we put it to this parable, we're gaining more talents. Well, you see, not too many people can understand this parable because they have never seen the kingdom. All, most of the uh, Christians in this world see the New Testament as black and white. It's talking about two kinds of people, saved people and lost people. And anything that sounds good in it, that's to the saved. Anything that sounds bad, that's for the lost. And they haven't yet learned that in the saved people, there are at least two other divisions. Those that's going to receive a reward and those that's going to suffer loss. And that's why they can't understand these parables, because they haven't seen reward and suffer of loss. Now let's see reward and suffer a loss in it. Here, we've already seen the reward of two of them. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Here in verse 28, Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him 
which hath ten talents. This is a principle of the judgment seat of Christ. Everybody that loses at the judgment seat of Christ, what they had will be given to those who gain reward. And they're seen as bound hand and foot, showing that they can do nothing, for they have no power for a thousand years. We'll see that in a moment. Verse 29, For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. Again, that same principle, so that you can understand that uh, there will be abundant amount of reward when you gain the reward, if we're fortunate enough to gain the reward, of all of the, of the uh, uh, personal goods of others. Now, verse 30. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, in another parable, that is the parable of the wedding guests, they bound them first, bind them hand and foot, and cast them into outer darkness. Now, you see, again, the average Christian in the world says the outer darkness is hell. has to be, because it's bad. It's not good, so therefore it doesn't go to Christians. It goes to lost people. But, you see, if you believe something just because it sounds bad and you don't check it out in the Scriptures, you may be violating all of the Scriptures and corrupting it. And we can't corrupt the Scriptures. Who did this man belong to? Well, as we begin the parable, we see that there were three servants. The first two were saved, and so was the third, because they were all servants. Our Lord never gives his personal goods to lost people. And so two of them at the judgment seat gained reward, and one of them suffered loss and was cast out into the outer darkness. And uh, let me again put this in perspective for you. In the Greek language in which our Bible originally written, the word outer darkness, there's two definite these, or two, there's two these, uh, actually two definite articles, which puts its emphasis on the second the. And it's written the darkness, the outer. The emphasis on something outside of the light. The light being the kingdom here. In the, in the parable of the wedding feast, it was the darkness outside the wedding feast. So, the word darkness, though, isn't pure darkness. It is the Greek word skotos. And it means shade. Or it means less light than where the center light is. And I've often used the parable that I myself made up of the Miss America contest. I like to use this as kind of a parable to teach this. Where if you have 50 girls all trying to get to be the crown Miss America, only one makes it. And when she makes it, they put the spotlight on her. But they don't dim the house lights. And they don't take everybody else there and throw them totally out of the place, indicating that they went to hell. <laughs> no. They're cast outside of the spotlight. She's the only one in it. The house light didn't dim. They didn't have to. Because anything outside of the spotlight is shade around that light. And that's really what that means. It means they're out of the kingdom. Out of the kingdom. Now what does this whole parable speak of? It speaks of the coming of the Lord. Verse 31. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him. Then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. Now, I know we're going into a different context, but this entire uh, immediate context speaks of his coming again and judging people 
according to what they did with what he gave to them and the thing that he gives to them in this parable is not the pound but the talent which is worth 300 times more and is equal to the second portion of the spirit speaking of the kingdom how much time do we have left a couple minutes I think we better maybe then cut off at this point next week I want to come back and give you the parable of the wise and faithful servant this as best as we can understand in the structure of the kingdom speaks of the highest part of the bride now there's two levels now perhaps the word level isn't the right word I'm a, maybe both all of this is together in one bride but but uh, whereas the the bride in the parable we spoke of this morning or this evening uh, is re is to be uh, uh, rewarded with having uh, being ruler over much and I think that's what it says, or many things, make you rule over many things, which suggests there'll be some things that they won't be ruler over. The parable, the next parable of the wise and faithful servant, they will be re made ruler over all that he has. So one is ruled over being ruler over many things, and the other being ruler over all that he has. And that all is part of the bride of Christ. I just simply call it two levels, whether there is actually two levels or not. And we do know that there is a third level to the rulership, and that is the level of the wedding guests. So you got the bride and the guests, the bride possibly in two divisions. And who knows, maybe hundreds or even thousands of little levels in between. We don't know. We look at the U.S. government. You got the president. You say, well, well he's got a cabinet. Yeah. And he's got. But as you begin to go out into the. Uh, uh, you got Congress. And then down underneath them, you got bureaus. All kind of bureaus. And from the top of the bureaus, the heads, all the way down to the workers in the bureaus. Literally millions and millions of people in a position of rulership, each one having a small portion of authority. Well, it could be the same in heaven when our Lord gives out the rewards. Those that will rule and reign with him. Some will have great rulership, and maybe others will have just a small rulership. Father, thank you for the hour. Bless it. Bless it truly to our hearts. Be with us as we leave this place and go into our own homes. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.